Welcome to the Mexpreneurs Podcast, the podcast about the stories of Mexican tech startup founders who are building world-class, fast-growing companies and having a positive impact at a large scale. My name is Sergio Chavez. I'm a Mexican based in Germany, a tech startup founder, executive, and mentor, and your host. Today, we have Juan Ocampo with us. Juan is the co-founder and chief operations officer of Skyflare, a cybersecurity startup from Berlin, Germany. Skyflare was founded in 2021 with a mission to make e-commerce safe for webshop owners. Last year, the company saved over 600,000 euros in marketing expenses to their more than 40 B2B customers through their click fraud protection solution. Juan is originally from Mexicali, Mexico. He moved to Berlin in 2013 to study a master's degree at the Technische Universität Berlin. He then entered the German startup scene, holding multiple roles as VC investor, startup founder, lecturer, and researcher with focus on prop tech, real estate, internet of things, and e-commerce. Juan is passionate about initiatives in the intersection of technology, education, and diversity. I hope you enjoy. Support for this episode comes from Partnership Leaders, the leading community of partnership professionals and executives in SaaS and tech with over 1,500 members globally. If you're a tech startup founder, you know that partnerships are essential for the success of your business. PL is the place to connect with decision makers in strategic, tech, and channel partnerships at leading SaaS and tech companies like HubSpot, Salesforce, Google, and AWS. PL is also a thought leader, creating incredible content on how you can leverage partnerships to take your tech startup to the next level. I'm a member of PL and have seen firsthand the richness and value of this incredible community. Visit partnershipleaders.com to learn more and to apply to become a member. Make sure to mention in your application that Mexpreneurs referred you so that you can receive a special price if your application is accepted. Hello, Juan. Welcome to the show. Hello, Sergio. Thank you very much for having me. So, Juan, please tell us, who is Juan Ocampo? Difficult question, as we have already told before. So, Juan Ocampo, I am Mexican. I'm a Mexican. I'm a German living in Germany since 10 years. I'm an engineer. I'm an entrepreneur. I am a friend. I'm an, a pragmatic person. I think I would say pragmatic would be the, one of the words that I would use to define me. But I do many things, and I think we will talk about them probably in the next minutes. But I basically live in Berlin, uh, work in the startup ecosystem. That's uh, in a nutshell. Many different facets. Many, many different ones. Many, many different ones. <laughs> but what would you say is like your grand vision, like your North Star as Juan Ocampo? I would say like there's three topics that are really relevant for me and they are maybe they change the priorities depending on where I am. But there are three topics. One of them, I would say it's technology and this would fit in the part of the startup founder. I've been working with startups for startups, founding my own startups, uh, investing in them. So technology is one of them, one of the biggest topics for that. But then the second part, I would say it's education. I'm really passionate about education. I've been teaching at university level, uh, undergraduate and graduate level uh, for almost 15 years in different universities in Mexico, here in Germany, outside of Germany. I'm teaching a class very soon in Lithuania, for instance, and I'm just very passionate about spending time with newer generations and just spreading knowledge. So education is the second topic. And then the third topic that you'll find where I spend my time and I just, again, I'm very passionate about it, is diversity in a lot of forms, right? And diversity, I think, is very important. I think diverse teams are very, very creative, very uh, efficient. And diversity is not just men and women, diversity can be understood in many different things, you know, like from backgrounds, ethnicities, sexual orientation. And that's also a topic where I just spend a lot of time with. So my North Star, if you want to see it like that or ask it like that, it has always those three topics, technology, education, and the part of diversity. And I love the fact that, as you mentioned, the priorities on each of those three topics have changed. Also, how you bring those three topics to life, it's been evolving as well, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Through time, there has been topics where I feel 
more passionate and maybe, you know, it's even not just like, it's not a daily thing that it changes, but it's basically, let's say a context, right? We met, you and I are here like around 10 years ago, nine years ago, and we met through a network where it was a little bit about, you know, work. And that was my, my technology part, but it was also very close to education. And it re- really depends on the site or on the place where I am as how I introduce myself, because sometimes it just makes more sense to talk a little bit more about specific actions, activities, clubs, or companies where I'm working for or on than just to present myself as this like three things guy that does everything and nothing at the same time. So uh, it really depends where I am of how I introduce myself. Yeah, But I think you're more and more coming into the intersection of all those three in your current setup. Definitely. Like I try and, and have been trying a lot for a time of just not, you know, be very jealous with my time, you know, of when and how I spend my time. So then what I do and try to do most of the time is to bring the three topics together. So how you're saying this intersectionality of those three things. And then I learn also with time, because I'm not 18 anymore, you got to be very selective with your energy also, right? Uh, some things, some spaces and some activities drain a lot of my energy for good things. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. They just like drain a lot of my energy and some other topics, they bring me a lot of energy. So it's about a balance, I would say. And it's most of the time, as I say, in these three topics, you can find me in some way in one of these three topics. And you were mentioned that it's been 10 years now since we know each other, but like, how has been that evolution? Like going all the way back to Mexico. So we were born in Mexico, studied in Mexico, and then made this huge leap to Germany. So how's been that? Please tell us a little bit about what that story has been like and some of the key highlights of it. It's been a roller coaster, I would say. It's been a roller coaster with ups and downs. It started actually, so we met around nine or 10 years ago here in Germany, 2013, 14, I, I guess. I came for the first time in 2009 as part of an exchange student. So I have a, a background in engineering. I study engineering. Uh, mechatronics engineering. I come from the north side of Mexico, small, I always say a small city, but it's very big for European standards. So my city is called Mexicali. It's at the border with California, uh, Mexicali. Think about it. The first part of the word Mexico comes from Mexico. The second part, Cali, comes from California. So it's like right at the border. I was born there, raised there. I'm a child, first child, the, the oldest child of two academic Persons, my mom and my dad used to work at university. They're now retired. They just retired a couple of years ago. And that's where I grew up. And then at one point, I always saw myself outside of Mexico, living international experiences. I was always fascinated, and maybe you can put it in here a little bit into the education part, always fascinated by languages. I started speaking French or learning French in university at 15 with the dream of moving to either France or Canada to study. And you know, life is what happens when you plan things. And that was how I started with my first or my second foreign language. And I never went, I have never been in Canada and I never went to France to study. And that's how it all started. I started university in Mexico because that first dream didn't really happen. And through the studies, I got the opportunity of applying to a program to come to Germany and do an internship here. And that was really interesting, was a little bit according to the plan that I had. So then I started learning German and I applied in 2008, 2009. I came for a year. I live in the South. I live in Baden-Württemberg, in Stuttgart, in in Saarbrücken for one year. Had the time of my life, early 20s, you know, you want to eat the world. And uh, I had a great time. I had great friends, a great experience. And I came back and finished my studies, worked for some time. And then I decided to come back to Germany where I just saw myself as my new home or my second home, if you want to call it like that. But what exactly happened with that original plan of Canada, France? Like, why didn't it work out? And how exactly is it that Germany came into play? I don't believe in luck, but I think that sometimes it's uh, it's a mix of different things that happen in life. So why it didn't happen, it's very easy to explain. 
I was, as I said, studying mechatronics, which was a new program in my university. I was the third or fourth generation of students, and we didn't have the proper certification, just as the regular programs. When I tried to apply to go to France, the French government just received applications from people studying in certified programs in Mexico. And mine was new. So they said, no, sir, you need a certification. You need me. If you would be studying mechanical engineering, maybe you could come. But your program is new. It's not certified. So we don't accept it. So that was very hard for me because I had been at that time already learning and studying and even teaching a little bit of French on the side. And then the German program didn't need a certification. So they say, if you want to come to Germany, if you're an engineer, we have this great program. We don't really care about the certification. And this is why I ended up, I think, luckily, I mean, in retrospective, luckily I ended up in Germany and it was just like that. I mean, it was um, something that I didn't plan. And you got a scholarship, isn't it, from the DAD or? I got a scholarship from the DAD and it was one year they would pay, I think they would pay like 200, 300 euros per month. Uh, they would pay your health insurance. And they also pay at the beginning a German language course here in Germany. So at the end, I was 12 months with a scholarship 2009, 2010. So you came here, you liked it, you went back to Mexicali, finished your studies, but then came back again. Uh, yes. But what, why, what did you ultimately ended up establishing here? Like, what was the main driver for ultimately moving completely from Mexico to Germany? That's a great question, and I'm not sure we have enough time to that for all the explanation. But basically, I would say that there were a couple of things that I would see how my life would be in many ways, professionally, personally, like many, many, many things. And I was not really up to that specific path. So the kind of jobs that you would have in Mexicali, it's very, I don't know if everyone is aware, but like the north side of Mexico, we have a very heavy industry, which we call maquila industry. And that would mean that I would have to follow that path, right? So that is almost every engineer at their life, what point in their life they work in that kind of industry, which is perfect. It's actually really nice, really interesting. But at that point, when I came back from Germany and people would look at my resume, they would say, oh my God, this uh, Juan guy, you know, I would apply to the, you know, the biggest ones, the most famous ones, companies. And then they would not believe that I would speak German or they would not believe that I would speak French or they would even tell me, why do you even study this? You don't need this. Like you just need English in here. I even had in one job that I had many jobs in there, but even one job where I, there was a machine that was not working. They called the company that did the maintenance of that machine and the technicians were German. And one colleague knew that I'd lived in Germany before that I spoke spoke and I'm making like air signals, spoke German. And then he sent me to talk to the mechanics, to the technicians, brought some people and then said like, hey, start speaking. So he was like, just didn't believe that I spoke German. He put it in doubt that I was, you know, what I it was in my resume. And that was not just for that, that was for many other things. So they would always, you know, try to challenge me on many things because I think they were just jealous, you know, they were just, um, they just felt maybe, I don't know, they, they were not okay with it. So that's why I was like, is this going to be the next 20 years of my life? You know, going throughout the ladder of like becoming a manager and having these kind of situations. And I was like, no, thank you. I know a place where I'm appreciated. I know a place where they want me and I know a place where I can bring value. And that's Germany. And they treat me well that year. And this is where I see myself back then for the rest of my life. That's how I thought about it. I thought many things in like permanent things, which sometimes I'm 35 already, things are not permanent, nothing is permanent. But basically, I just didn't like these situations. And I was like, yep, you know what, let's go to Germany. I had a great time there. And the second time that I moved, I also needed something bigger, like Saarbrücken is a, Saarland is a 300,000 people state. 
and Stuttgart. I'm not really sure how big it is, but it's not on the biggest three or four cities here in Germany. So I just was like, let's go to the biggest one. Let's go to the capital. And I had spent my birthday in the capital when I was doing this exchange and I had a great time. I had a weekend in here and I was like, why not? You know, let's go there. And you ultimately arrived here. And despite all these great experiences that you had, like, as you mentioned, it's not been easy, but how's been that journey since you ultimately established here in Germany, actually all the way until you did further studies, you ended up also entering into the startup world, which if I'm not mistaken, that was probably not at the very beginning, probably top of mind, but you ended up entering the startup world. Like how was that journey? So back in 2012, I that was when I decided I, I'm going to go back. I could either look for jobs or look for an easier access, let's say. And then I thought, well, you know, I can study a, a master's degree. I can study a second master's degree. I did one in Mexico. And then I applied to the TU Berlin. I got a visa as a student and I started studying something like production engineering, which was something that I was more familiar with. So I came here, I work in Mexico in the aerospace industry. I did my internship in Germany, in Stuttgart, in the aerospace industry. So the last thing I was thinking about was startups or the startup ecosystem. I actually wanted to, you know, work in the aerospace industry, but as I, I don't know if, you know, people listening to this, um, to this podcast know, there are pretty much three jobs that you can have maybe in Berlin. One of them is being a DJ. Another one is maybe working in the startup ecosystem. And then the third one is being an artist. So there's no industry in Berlin. I landed, when I was studying in here, I landed my first job as a production engineer of a small startup company that needed to do quality checks in the sensors that they were producing. It was an IoT company, Internet of Things. And this is how I landed. I applied. It was very easy as I searched on Google, working student jobs, Berlin, and like a couple of keywords, I applied to maybe 10 different places. They call me from five. And then I landed a job at my first startup. Exactly 10 years ago, I was, and I was reflecting about that in these days, um, because I was probably in these weeks, 10 years ago on the interviews. And I started on the 1st of December, my first job in this, in this startup. And it was not something that I planned at all. It was much more something that it was luck. I just found that job and that got me through the whole master program. At one point, I started looking for a new job as the end of the master was coming to the end. And I talked to my boss back then, one of the founders of this company, and I told her that I had been a great time, but I needed to move on, that I was already going to assessment centers. Like in Sweden, I went to one. I really wanted to go to the next phase. And then she made me an offer that I couldn't refuse, which was pretty much, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, this is these and this is these are interesting things but you don't have them in your company there's like positions that i want to do i want to work with erp systems i want to work with like product management i want to work with so many things that you don't have in your company and then she said well juan you know i'm the founder let's create those positions for you what do you want that position to be called and i remember we went a couple of times for lunch just brainstorming on what could i do for her company and what kind of positions i could do what was the name of the position do i want to be a manager do i want to be this do i want to be doing that and she just like customized as if i had been going to mcdonald's and saying Please put on the hamburger ketchup and put lettuce and put this and take off this and take off that. And I think that I stayed not just because of the offer, but I pretty much stayed because of the trust and the relationship I had built with this founder, with the owner of the company, one of the owners. There were three owners, three founders. I had a great relationship with them, but it was one of them that I worked together or worked for. And uh, that was why. I stay in that company and I stay for five years until I finished my master's and when I did the transition to start my PhD. So I stayed there for five years and I changed back in, uh, in 2018. I think this is when I left the company. I was like the fifth employee, sixth employee. And then I left and at one point we were more than 80, right? So this company really allowed me also to see how you 
built and scale up a company and it was one of the greatest schools I had. Besides, of course, what I had learned in Mexico, which is why they had hired me in the first place, right? They needed someone with experience in production. What you mentioned is an incredible story. So you were a working student and at the end, the founder created the positions and the roles for you to continue developing inside the company. But that's very unusual. Not like I don't think every working student had such a privilege. But in your view, like, what was that something that you brought or what was that something that you did to prove how much of a value you were for the company and for the founder to take these extra like huge step into basically investing in your career that's how i would maybe that's a question for her uh, that will be a great question to, to you know to to ask her i don't know what she saw in me i remember that at one point uh, there are many of course we worked five years together right so in those five years i guess a lot of things happen i think she and i remember that at one point she said maybe in the first year after she hired me, that she said, well, you know, you had some experience as an engineer, but you also study in my same university. So she also graduated from TU Berlin. And she said, if you graduate from TU Berlin, that means you can graduate from challenges because she said that it's a very chaotic university. She said, if there is someone in here that has this background and is going through what I went and she did also her PhD and her diploma in that university, she was like, maybe she found maybe a first connection in there. I think throughout time, I was just very, I think Mexicans are people that they find, we grew up with many different challenges. It can be in any way, right? It can be economical challenges, educational challenges, it can be anything. And we are raised up to overcome the challenges. And when you're in a startup, you have all kinds of challenges, right? From no money to no customers to uh, a lot of issues and problems. And I think that every activity or every problem or every goal she gave me, I found always a way to solve it, right? Um, and we're talking about 10 years ago, 2013, where maybe, you know, not, we don't have the same kind of technology that we have right now. I guess maybe she just like how I solve the problems. And that is one of my theories, but I think you can ask her because she's my co-founder in the company where I work right now. So we went from being a boss and an employee to then different, uh, to different projects. And now we're co-founders together in one company, but it's definitely not a normal or a regular story, as you say. Not every working student from a company ends up founding a new company or, you know, the last position I had at that at Kiwi, which is uh, the company that I'm talking about, I was the director of operations, the head of operations. It was an amazing school. And I think it was the trust that we built together, why we are still working together, not just there, but later on, and I guess we're going to talk about it in the investment company that she founded, where when once again, at one point I told her, and this is maybe also something that I discovered myself, I have like this five-year cycles in my life where I just told her after four years, Claudia, I'm no longer happy here. I think I'm no longer bringing the value that I should be bringing to your company. I want to quit. I want to do something else and I'm giving you a one year notice. Let's find someone that can replace me. I have been here since the beginning. There's a lot of things that are documented, but there's a lot of things that are still in my mind and in my head. Let's work one year together in documenting, in finding my replacement, and in one year I can leave. And I think it's a fair offer to both sides. I have one year to find out what I want, and you have one year to find a new employee. And I think that also, again, is not something that happens everywhere, right? I could have just, you know, quit from one month to the other. I told her one year before that I was not happy. And in that process, not exactly at the beginning when I quit, but in that process of one year of finding my replacement, which we found the great guy that has been, you know, took the operations team, sorry, to the next level. In that process, I discovered that I wanted to work in the same field, but work with more startups, right? Work with like maybe accelerators, work with investors, work with people that maybe I didn't need to stay five years in the same company, but I could change very quickly. Like a consultant, you change every three months, six months. I wanted to change maybe every year, 
but work for the same in the same area, but a faster, a more agile, let's say, uh, view. And then she told me at one point when I had already quit and said, this is going to be my last day in like five months, right? Like really plan ahead. She told me, Juan, I'm going to open an investment company. I have already the investors and I want to do it with you. Like do it with us. Come with us. You know, we know you already for four and a half years. Uh, you can come with us. And then again, I was like, okay, we had the same discussion that we had when she offered me the first full-time job. I was like, what kind of name? Am I going to be an investment manager? Am I going to be? And she was like, let's brainstorm about the topic. We ended up choosing for my topic, the name of venture builder or venture management, something like that. I don't remember the, the exact name. But then again, she gave me the opportunity of going into to a place where this is what I want to do, backing up what I was thinking about my plans as long as I was open about that. And then we invested, we started from zero investments. And right now we invested together in more than 20 companies. We have one of the, I would say, one of the best portfolios in our specific niche market. We invest in smart building technology and property management software. One of the first ones in Germany, one of the most acknowledged ones also in West Germany. And I would say one of the most successful ones and one of the most diverse ones, I would also say, because it's a fund that is being founded by a woman. We don't have a lot of women founding funds, investment funds in Europe. I have another colleague and then myself, another colleague who's also a woman in me. And I always joke that we're the most diverse venture capital in Europe because of how we are built. And I have been working with them in this construct for five years already. So actually, again, I started in November. I just turned five years in this company. Now I'm the principal investment manager. And I also like kind of like a general management with a legal representation of the company. And I'm very happy with it. One I, again, another dream that came true of something that I wanted to do. That that was the next project of how we continue working together. And of course, we're going to dive deeper once we talk with your co-founders in the next interview. But just a, a short summary: like, how did that then evolve into Skyflare? Basically, on my last year and a half at Kiwi, the company that Claudia founded, the CTO working with us was Sahar, which is our co-founder. That's how we met. So Claudia went to Israel to hire him. She brought him from Israel. Then he worked with us together. She as the COO, me as the head of operations, and Sahar as the CTO of the company. We worked together as a team for almost two years. That's how I met him. And because again, and I'm going to come back to this five-year cycle that I have, five years, it's already there. You can see them. At the beginning of the year, I was already saying, I'm a little bit tired. I don't know what it is. I know the pandemic happened and that changes a lot of things, but I need to do something else. I'm also finishing my PhD and this is the perfect opportunity to go to the next level, whatever the next level is. I had no idea what the next level is, but I was like, let's make a change. And this is how, because I was closing chapters, the chapter of Hyrus Ventures, in a way, I still work uh, for them and I still do investments. I was last week in Portugal uh, looking for investments to keep investing. But this is how this closing of chapters, it was how I decided I'm going to confound um, Skyflare and work for the success of, of this new company now as a founder, but also with what I see it as the dream team for me. Claudia, a person that I respect and a person that I uh, really, really like, a professional that I really, really like, has my trust for 10 years. And also Sahar, who we worked together for some years and then we became friends after I quit and he continued working there. So this is why I was like it's the perfect scenario from my perspective. Now, I would like to quickly turn tables a little bit into your connection with Mexico. Like, how do you keep connected with Mexico? What's your current setup in that sense? Besides eating tacos every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of connections with Mexico. One of them is how we met through this network of Mexicans 10 years ago. And even though I'm not really close to that network anymore, I still see them every now and then in some events. There are a couple of ways I still give back because I think it's all about giving back and not waiting to be 70 years old to give back. 
but like giving back all the time. So one of the ways is I work with a couple of universities in Mexico and I every year I give one or two conferences when I talk about my experience and I tell them it's possible. I was not the straight A's student. I, yes, I had good grades, but it was not about I was the best student. It was about the ambition that I had. And it was about the clear plan that I had that and I knew I wanted to be doing what I'm doing right now. So I try to be very close to Mexican universities. I try to be very close to them, to be making these conferences. And also I've been working with some associations and clubs here in Germany that concentrate or bring together Latin people. And I think the most recent example is the Foreign Office of Mexico has a specific program where they're trying to educate all kinds of people outside about their financials, any kind of financials, like buying real estate to having a savings account to investing. And uh, they invited me to be one of their speakers and to be one of the people they come to when it comes to what I call technological entrepreneurship, which is very different to just opening, let's say, a store to sell maybe glasses or sell something to a technological entrepreneurship, which is what I've been doing the last 10 years, working in them, investing in them and building them, right? Skyflur, which we'll talk about later, is my second one. I had another one before, which is Rista, which I was also part of the managing team. And we had a sensor used for buildings to check all kinds of room climate parameters. And this is my expertise, technological entrepreneurship. So this is how I support the MBA on bringing people that would speak about stuff to Mexicans or to Latin people or even to people that also speak German or talking myself about my experiences or supporting other people in their journeys of technological entrepreneurship, which is a very specific type of founding experience. So Juan what's your best advice for others that would like to follow a similar path? So other Mexicans, other international professionals looking to follow a similar path as, as what you've had? I think maybe three things to just be very quick about it. I think resilience is really important. This is not something that will be from day one, you'll be successful. People will tell you all the time that they don't understand your product, that they don't understand why you're doing it, that they don't understand that it's difficult. So it's a very difficult way. So resilience, it is one of the most important values you need to develop. That's one. I would say the second advice is the people that you frequent, the people that you see are also very important, are part of the journey. You should also be taking advice. I'm not saying it's not valuable advice. Everyone, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but you should also be taking advice from people that have already gone through what you're going through, meaning Yes, there are tons of people outside that can give you a class about what is business model canvas, about what is this and that, but have they built something and have they gone through the same struggles of not finding investors? Have they found the investors? Have they raised a company of 20, 50 million euros? These are the people that will give you valuable advice about the specific things that you need. So you need to be very, very careful about the people that you're receiving advice from. And then the third thing I think is reading, Sergio. I think reading is super important. I think it just uh, amplifies the creativity that you might have in order to find solutions to problems. And it can be anything. I'm, I'm saying like everything. You can be reading fictional things. You can be reading non-fictional things. I always have a book with me when I'm in the subway. So it's always about just continue learning, I would say, you know, but I think the reading part, it's something that's really important. So resilience, people, reading. And reading and knowledge, yes. We come back to the education part, right? We come back to the education and the intersection between technology, education, and diversity, which is also part of the diversity in terms of thinking as well. Correct. Yeah. Juan, thank you very much for being today in the show. Appreciate it. And thank you for sharing this wonderful journey you've been into. Thank you very much, Sergio, for having me here. And thanks to you for joining us today. Please remember to subscribe via your favorite podcast app to be notified about new episodes and share with us your feedback. We would love to hear from you. Thank you also to the Mexpreneurs team, Valeria Morel, Hector Barragan from Hypervoltage, Francisco Jaimes, Pamela Elizalde, Katia Cruz, Rocio Marroquín. I am Sergio Chavez. See you next time.